What is the business model of social media? These extremely valuable companies, they don't charge anything for the services. And what could go wrong with such a business model? Well, it has to do with persuasive technology. Now, persuasion goes all the way back to Aristotle and his three pillars of persuasion, logos, ethos, and pathos. And lucky us, I'm not gonna go into that today. <laughs> so I'm gonna jump right a few few millennia forward. And, um, but it's also in, in uh, so I'm here in, in communication, that's, that's my, my home field. And communication is based on persuasion. So that has nothing to do, this is much older than technology. Philosophy of persuasion and mass persuasion, actually it came with the study of propaganda, especially during the Second World War, where also the, the Nazi party in Germany used for the first time media, the, the TV and the radio for propaganda reasons. So there was persuasion through technology already with a, with a quite negative connotation. And since then, it has, since the, since the 1930s and 40s, it's been a very active field of study. How do we use media to persuade, brainwash, change the mind of people? Now, what happened in the, in the Second World War with the Nazis, they took for the first time, they created the Volksempfänger, the receptor of the people, uh, and they created this, you know, a TV and a radio that was actually quite affordable for the general public for like what well, today would probably be like around $100. Finally, the people could have it. Now, they eliminated the uplink, a radio is a two-directional technology. You, you can spill like sometimes an airplane, you know, in the Amazon and whatever, and airplanes are flying, they talk over the radio, over, out, and so forth. So, but they eliminated the uplink and only used the downlink and basically created broadcasting. They were not so interested in what the people were actually saying. They just wanted to put the propaganda down. And that business model, which is technology is socially constructed. See, that's an example of how this, now this ideology shaped a technology into like, we just have downlink and broadcasting. And that then became uh, evolved into modern broadcasting, TV and radio and so forth, that evolved over the, over the next decades. And by the 1970s, we had a business model made out of this, which is called basically the, the attention economy. So we had the attention economy back then. This little excerpt here from the 1970s also has taught us something very important. It has to do with the business model of social media. It says, if you don't pay for the product, you are the product. So who is the product in TV? Well, the product in TV is your attention. So a minute in the Super Bowl commercial costs, I don't know how much money because what they're buying is, well, eyeballs, they call it a buying attention. So you don't pay for watching TV. So what is actually transacted is your attention. What is being sold is your attention and who buys it, which is sold by the platform provider, by the, by the TV offerer, and who buys it is the one who, who buys the ads. So there's a seller and a purchaser, and what is being transacted, the product, is basically you. It's your attention. So in this business model then basically evolved also uh, to, to the digital age, where again, we don't charge for social media, right? You can use that for free, not only social media, you also don't pay for Google Maps and for other things. So what is being transacted? Well, remember the 70s, if you don't pay for a product, very likely you are the product. So let's listen uh, to actually what uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook has to say about that. And I'm showing here Facebook because Facebook is very important because Facebook is the first social network in history, offline or online, that connected 2 billion daily active users and 3 billion monthly active users out of, I mean, there's only 8 billion people on planet Earth. 7 billion of them have a, have a phone, so it's two or three out of, let's say, seven or eight. I mean, that's a big percentage together in one social network. So we often use Facebook in this pioneering role. And you might or might not have a Facebook account, but bear with me today. We're going to study it a little bit because it teaches us about the effect of these large social networks. So let's listen to the founder and CEO of this largest social network that, that we created in history. He was invited to the Congress of the United States and this senator here is questioning exactly about that. Let's check in. 
Nothing in life is free. Everything involves trade-offs. And these great websites that don't charge for access, they extract value in some other way. So how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. I see. All right. Oh, wow. OK. So I mean, whoa. Good that we have these senators, right? They don't shy away from asking the really tough questions. Right? And now, finally, we've been wondering for like decades, and you now finally we know that the cat is out of the sack, the card is on the table, now we finally know. They, they run ads. OK, all right, OK. So that's, that's how they actually you know, have their business model. So that's, that's what they do. And we have to talk about a little bit more about that. But let's first of all see how Facebook actually runs ads. So I just here went on my Facebook account and I bought an ad. So you just have a post. And then if you have a public account, you can boost that. And I then specified my audience that I want this post to reach. Because I can specify the audience because Facebook knows a lot about people that use it. That is first ingredient of the business model. So I specified I want, I don't care about if it's men or women, I, but I want them to be between 13 and 20 years old. And I want them to live around 25 miles around Menlo Park. That's where Facebook is headquartered here in Northern California and in San Francisco. And then I do a little bit detailed targeting. I want them to be addicted to, to games and websites. I'm very interested in distilled beverage and liquor, wine, of course, well, very good alcoholic. Choice of the alcoholics. Uh, chocolate as well. I mean, talk, talk about addiction, like talk about chocolate, right? I want them to be away from the family and away from the hometown and in a long distance relationship that is complicated. And I want them to be new parents of a newborn, like less than one year old. I want them to be like really like in a, in a really stressful situation. And I want them to show purchasing behaviors that that really attracted to some offers. And I want them to have a really old phone. Like, let's say a 2G like phone, like it's like basically a flip phone. I want them pretty, pretty, pretty poor too. All right. So I want them being stressed. I want them to be addicted. I want them, I want them vulnerable. And then Facebook tells me, hey, we know a lot about the people, right? So here around Menlo Park, we have between 7.9 and 9.2 thousand, let's say eight, eight or 9,000 people that you could target there. And then it tells me, okay, so what do you want to get out of them? And that's the first ingredient. You can actually, since you know them so well, you can actually choose what you want to get out of them. You can persuade them. So it says, do you want to get more messages out of them or do you want to get more engagement out of them? Or automatic, let Facebook select the most relevant goals based on your settings. Let's go automatic. Let's trust artificial intelligence. And then they tell us how much does it cost? Well, to reach between 61 and 178, let's say you know, uh, up to 200 people almost, it costs uh, per day. It costs about $12, so we run it for seven days. For yeah, That's fine, right? So we reach about 100 and 180 people per day for a week, $12. That's, that's a good budget. And then, oh, almost done. Oh, no, no, no. I can also leverage Facebook's data to automatically deliver different ad creative variations to people when likely to improve performance. So Facebook knows people so well that it can create, and you'll talk about what that is, that has to do with the A-B testing, that it creates different variations of the content that I show, and I can have this creative advantage because it knows them so well, and then it goes in and brainwashes them. Well, that sounds pretty evil. And actually, there is this interesting book. I love the title, Evil by Design. This is an interface designer who wrote uh, basically a, a book about persuasive technology, uh, Chris Nolan, he structured the book according to the seven, seven capital sins, pride, sloth, gluttony, anger, envy, lust, and greed, and it actually works out perfectly. So actually, it's, it's a very, like, it's interesting how you could structure that, that book according to these chapters. So let's dive into all these elements that, you know, that sound so evil that they actually trigger at the end the seven capital sins. So let's break it down a little bit. First of all, I want to say, that the narrative of being the evil, like th this is this is not true, the, the, the puppeteers, right? So sometimes the narrative comes up and the, it's more like a conspiracy theory that actually all these Silicon Valley masters, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, and so they sit in the basement together with the Joker and the Penguin and the Bond villain and they smoke cigars and they drink whiskey and they think like, how can we dominate the world? And it's, no, that's actually, no, I, I never met actually also an evil person in, in Silicon Valley. It's not, that's, that's really not the, the intention. So it's not this, it's rather this. 
This is called A-B testing. What they're doing, there's not even, even actually a lot of psychologists in Silicon Valley that think about how can we change people's minds? How can we persuade them? So basically how these most powerful persuasion technologies, these mind-changing technologies came about is through this A-B testing. And basically that's how it works. A-B testing comes from there are two versions of something. It's also what Facebook offered us in the previous slide, they say, for example, there are two headlines and one has a purple font and one has a yellow font. And I show that to different people. And then I see how they react. I will just study them. And I see like some people with some characteristics respond rather to the yellow font. And then I look back and it's like, okay, what were these characteristics? I don't understand why. And big data doesn't need to understand why. It just says, well, this goes with this. And so we keep on doing that. And that's what actually happens. So I just program it blindly. It's an evolutionary algorithm. It's mutation, selection, retention. Mutation, selection, retention. Now I can accelerate that a lot. And evolution is very smart, but very slow. Now I do this mutation, selection, retention, well, purple, yellow, green, or whatever, like different variations, very fast. With millions and billions of blog posts and web posts, uh, social media posts or other or images or whatever I have. And I can fine tune, evolution finds this, this evolutionary algorithm, A-B testing, finds that uh, extremely fast. Now, what's the downside? And I do some spoiler alerts about what is to come later. The downside is that we actually don't know what the machine is doing. It just says, well, this, it does this, and this is effective. And what we will talk in a little bit about is that that can have unintended consequences. For example, it might notice that it shows you some kind of image, you might pay attention to it. So it shows you that image again, because it's like, oh, that you pay attention to it. And one of the things we pay attention to, some of the things we pay attention to, we are genetically programmed to pay attention to. For example, when you see a car accident, you cannot not pay attention to it. I mean, of course, <laughs> next time you drive by, you're really not going to look, right? You're not going to look. You're like, I'm not one of those people who are kind of looking. Like, no, you will really just like, drive. But, you know, you have this urge. We all, we all know. We, we have this urge. We have to look because that's genetically programmed into us. It's genetically programmed that because uh, an accident is dangerous. It could kill you. So you need to know what's going on. So you have this urge for an evolutionary reason. We are all descendants of those who had this urge. The other ones, they didn't really care. And... Oh, they were eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So it's good that we have this urge. But what the A-B testing algorithm might conclude is that, oh, if I really want your attention, talking about the attention economy, I show you car accidents all day long because you cannot not pay attention to it, right? So but that, would be, that would not be a very good outcome. So these are the kind of like negative side effects that you have. Now it actually goes a step further. Because what we're doing here, this was the TV paradigm I showed you from the 70s. The attention, like the, the seconds of the Super Bowl ads that cost so much money and that you are the product because you don't pay for it. Now, this new paradigm is not beyond the attention economy. It's like, I sometimes call it, you know, you could call it the persuasion economy. It's actually based on inducing behavioral change. So what happened here? with Facebook, it knows you so well, it knows your data so well, and we will talk more about it, it knows you better than your family, than your partner, than you yourself, and it knows exactly how to trigger you. And with that, it can induce behaviors. Well, first of all, it can predict behaviors because it knows you very well. And one way to predict behavior is to trigger you. Now, that's why it's always so difficult on Thanksgiving when you're with a family because your family really knows how to trigger you because they know you so well. You know, your siblings, they really know how to trigger you. Or their uncle or your parents, or geez, going back home, you know, like that is, they really know how to trigger you. Why? Because they know you so well. Now, guess what? Artificial intelligence knows you better. And it knows you also then how to trigger you. And if I know you, I mean, if I kick you against the shin, you will react. So if I do... You know, A-B testing, blind A-B testing, there's no evil intentions. Is that? There's no evil intention. They just say like the algorithm just figures out, hey, I kick you against the shin, I can predict your response. <laughs> yeah, of course, you can predict your response when I kick you against the shin, right? So, but then actually social media makes money, not with your attention. It makes money with your predictable behavioral change. So see how I set up the Facebook ad? What I basically did here, like I only have to pay for if, these people, 
for example. I could buy, have bought engagement. If so many and so and such many people engage with my post, click, like, purchase something, and every time there's a predictable behavioral change, that's basically their business model. They would say so many hundreds or thousand people are the potential audience that we could get to click on your ad. So, and every time there's a successful, predictable behavioral change, then it makes cha-ching. Now, in the social media, in the persuasive technology uh, cash register. That's actually how it works. So, beyond the attention only, the attention is just to get to know you. And beyond that, then getting to predict your behavioral change. So, you could call this the, the persuasion or the uh, inducing behavioral change or the brainwash economy. Call it as you may. But that is what this actually is about. That's, that's the underlying business model of these persuasive technologies, which are so persuas pervasive <laughs> in social media. This persuasive technology has a long history. As I said, you could think about the Nazi propaganda as a persuasive technology. Now, when it came to interactive persuasive technology, so the Nazis only had the downlink, the broadcasting, and then you know, modern technology came about with the internet. In the 1990s in Stanford, there's a very, uh, very important, very influential the Stanford Persuasive Technology Labs. Now, if you open their website today, you can see how often the word ethical is written on that web page. And Professor Falk uh, did some very beautiful contributions to, to, to inducing behavioral change. Also like how you hear this beautiful book of how you can change your, your own habits to become a better person. Uh, and that also has to do with it. How can you yourself you know, become a more healthy person, for example? Actually, economists have been working on that. A recent Nobel Prize in economics has been awarded to what these economists call nudging. So uh, how can you nudge somebody into a desired direction? And that's very important for public policy. You want people not to smoke so much because it's really expensive for your healthcare system. You want people to use more public transportation. You want people to donate organs. And so how can you nudge people in behavioral economics, it's very important, into the desired direction. So that's a very a, a field that goes way beyond technology and is on a Nobel Prize. Now, what we do here, of course, what we do is we throw artificial intelligence on it. And as you know from a previous lecture, artificial intelligence has this paradigm the other way around. Artificial intelligence nowadays, as I said before, is mainly machine learning. And machine learning works the other way around. So what we did previously is we had some observation of reality data, and then we had an algorithm a recipe, right? You know that from a previous lecture, the algorithm is basically, you know, the way of doing things, a recipe, and the recipe could be used to nudge you, for example, to nudge you to a, a specific outcome. And that would be the traditional, that would be traditional way to go about it. Now, what machine learning does is it turns it around. We have the data in a social network, for example, we have well, people and your friends and, and, and the content. Um, and then we have the goal output. Well, what's the goal output of a social media company? Well, it's a company. So per definition, per definition, it needs to make money, period. Now that's, that's the definition of a company. So it needs to make profit. So it wouldn't make profit, it couldn't sustain itself as a company. So that's, well, very generally, I mean, Senator, uh, we run ads. And then the master algorithm, as Pedro Dominguez calls it, the machine learning algorithm tells us, well, what is the best way to combine you, your friends, and all the content into making profit? So that's what the machine learning algorithm actually figures out. Now, Sometimes that is, then we have to see like, what, what is the algorithm actually doing? And I showed you some examples before when that can go astray. So we have to look basically inside this algorithm that combines, Senator, we run ads, ads and profits with social dynamics. And that led to a new field of study that I'm also involved in. That's the study of machine behavior, because it's not really clear what these algorithms do. And if these algorithms are really aligned, talking about AI alignment, a term we will come back to later, alignment with, with what we actually are looking for. So to cite a recent study, today's social algorithms are so complex that looking at the algorithms will not yield much insight because the interplay of social algorithms and behaviors yield patterns that are fundamentally emergent. These patterns cannot be gleaned from reading code. So even the people who write the code won't understand what the algorithm does. And even if you have the code, you understand what it does. Why? 
because the algorithm interacts with social reality. So the input is the social dynamics and the goal you give it, and then the algorithm mixes this together. So you, you cannot predict really from the code alone what happens. You also would need to know everything that happens right now with all the humans and the people. Now, how can you then basically study what these social algorithms do? Well, you study them like you study humans. Uh, you run them through a lab, so you basically audit them. So we cannot certify that an AI agent is ethical by looking at its source code. Any more than we can certify that humans are good by scanning their brains. All we can do is we can study their behavior. And that leads to the field of, of algorithmic audits. And that's what we do. We run these algorithms to a lab, through a lab and then see, well, how do they behave in this and this and in this condition and that condition? And that's an entire new field that will, in the decades to come, need a lot, a lot of attention in order to understand better what, what our social algorithms, this mix between social dynamics and, and algorithmic dynamics, what they produce. Talking about algorithmification of this social dynamic. So we will use this framework now and uh, in the rest of the lecture, go around these three, basically these three blocks. Uh, we will first ask about what algorithms know from the past, that's the data input, and spoiler alert, they know a lot, a lot about you. And second, then we talk about what algorithms know and can know about the future. So I said, well, some things they know better, if they kick you against the shin, it's pretty certain how you, how you might react when you do that. So having more data allows you to make better predictions. And then third of all, what we know so far about the resulting algorithmic's behavior. And there here we go, we're in baby shoes because this is a very, the, the study of machine behavior and algorithmic auditing is a very new field, but that's where we will end up. And then finally, we will talk about, well, what to do about that.